Um, Walt Guy's biography is on the website. I hope you've had a chance to look at it. Uh, I'll just say briefly that um, I guess of all the lecturers coming, that uh, Walt is the only one who is still actually working actively for NASA. He's head of uh, automation robotics division, division chief at the Johnson Space Center. Um, but that's not what he's talking about here. Uh, he's talking about the job that he used to do for about 20 years, uh, which was uh, head of environmental thermal life support and crew systems. Uh, and of course, the crew systems includes all the space suits and the good stuff that, that I was fortunate enough to, to get to use. So I've, I've got a personal debt of thanks to, to Walt. Um, Aaron, I think you, you wanted to say a, a couple of things, so I'll pass the, the microphone to you. Yes, I'd like to just say a few words about Walt. We've worked together for many years, and uh, Walt, <clears throat> Walt Guy has the very unique uh, capability of being not only a, an outstanding engineer, technical person, but he also has a very unique capability of being a great uh, or an outstanding project manager, program manager. No matter what task you gave Walt, he could deliver the product on performance, on schedule, and on time. He has that unique capability. He's done that from the Apollo program to the shuttle program. And I think you're really in for a treat to hear Walt talk about the uh, environmental control system. Uh, he has a lot of information to offer you. So without further ado, let me uh, turn it over to Walt. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, as Aaron said, we uh, work together uh, uh, over several programs uh, over a long period of time. I was uh, noticing the picture, I'm sure that wasn't put there for me, but my current responsibilities are the robotic arm you see there, that's a shuttle arm, of course, the station arms also, grapple fixture over here on the left, and the, uh, the little uh, jet pack on the, the tumbling crewman there is part of my current responsibilities. Uh, the 20 years that uh, Jeff mentioned, uh, uh, I was responsible for the development of the, uh, the shuttle spacesuit. So uh, it's like uh, like it was meant for me anyway. Um, what I'd like to do is uh, talk about the design. Uh, I know in the syllabus it said environmental control system. So where did all the rest of this stuff come from? If you go back in perspective, the uh, Mercury Gemini Apollo program had the classical thing that uh, aerospace calls environmental control system. It was basically a cabin system. It uh, took care of the, the living quarters for the, for the crew. Um, but uh, in the shuttle era, the uh, responsibility of that system expanded to include uh, more than just uh, the cabin and uh, thus the very long, hard to say name. These are the subsystem elements of the uh, environmental, thermal control, and life support system. Uh, the first area I'm going to... Uh, what happened here? There we go. Sorry. These are the areas, the subsystems. The first area is the cabin atmospheric revitalization system. This is a, a long way of saying to take care of the atmosphere uh, in the cabin. Uh, humans are pollutants, uh, and, uh, and this is the system that takes care of, the, of that. The cabin atmospheric pressure and composition. This is uh, obviously the maintaining the pressure and enough oxygen for, uh, for breathing. The third is the cabin thermal control, and that is the classical environmental control system. But for shuttle, we've uh, added some functions. One is the water and waste management subsystem. Uh, there's some hygiene functions required. There's some uh, recharge of uh, the spacesuit's uh, backpack, management of the fuel cell water system, because uh, the fuel cells are the electrical uh, power supply and provide a lot of uh, extra water. Uh, also, the vehicle at this point has as a dedicated uh, active thermal control system that takes care of all of the systems in the vehicle, not just the cabin systems. And then last is the uh, airlock sub support subsystem. Uh, the, uh, this is the EVA crewman's portal to space. And uh, so the environmental thermal control and life support system covers uh, all these areas. What I'll do is, is uh, go through each one of those 
the first is the cabin atmospheric revitalization system. Uh, its uh, functions are uh, CO2 and trace gas removal, humidity control, environmental cooling, and atmospheric circulation and ventilation. Uh, again, I'll talk uh, each uh, about these, um, but I do want to mention that, that there is a, uh, a uniqueness about space and that there's no uh, convection, so circulation uh, is important. Also, because of the fact that uh, there is no convection, getting rid of, rid of uh, uh, the body uh, heat, the latent heat, uh, requires a, a ventilation uh, of the crew. So each of these uh, uh, areas uh, ended up as part of the, the system design. This is the uh, uh, an overview silhouette of the orbiter. I'll use this throughout the presentation. As you can see, the part of the system we're talking about now, the atmospheric revitalization system, is located up front where the crew is. Uh, it's beneath the floor. Uh, and uh, the, we'll be talking about the systems in the remainder of the orbiter as we go along. This is the uh, simplified schematic. Um, I'd like to start uh, at the, uh, the cabin fans. Uh, these are redundant. Uh, each fan will do the job. Uh, the next in line is the uh, CO2 scrubber, uh, followed by the cooler, the cabin heat exchanger. There is a bypass around that for uh, control of the amount of cooling that's needed. As you're aware, the shuttle can fly with a uh, few or many crewmen. Uh, it turns out toward, uh, as time has gone on, we fly pretty much a full complement, but the original design was to fly uh, a small number of crewmen. Uh, also, this does give you temperature control. The same heat exchanger provides the condensation of the, uh, the water from the atmosphere, therefore you get humidity control, and then that's collected. Uh, the gas continues on, it's now chilled, and is provided out to the flight deck and the mid-deck uh, to the, uh, the crew. Uh, then the, crew f the gas from the cabin is then drawn back in uh, through some flight deck avionics and uh, back through the fan. So this is the basic uh, system schematic. Um, I might uh, pause here a moment to sort of explain the, the role of uh, the government in uh, the development of the shuttle. As you know, the, the prime was, uh, was Rockwell. Uh, it was their job to build the vehicle. Uh, but the government uh, philosophy, management philosophy, was to, uh, to have ownership of the technical aspects of the design. So we had uh, uh, basically no excuse. If, if it didn't work, it wasn't because the contractor did something wrong. We had to have uh, uh, ownership. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, Aaron, uh, as a project manager, uh, would probably look to us first as the reason for a problem as opposed to Rockwell because we were the conscience of the program. So we should have uh, made sure they didn't do it wrong and, and uh, provided whatever uh, technical insight to Aaron to, uh, to make sure he made the programmatic decisions to, to make sure things weren't done, done wrong. So very early in the, the shuttle program, uh, I was responsible for a, an engineering organization, and that engineering organization uh, wanted to own the design of the uh, environmental thermal control and life support system. So we... I'll have to get used to this, won't I? We uh, acquired uh, a chamber. This is a near atmospheric chamber. It's a uh, square, so it's obviously not shaped like the, uh, uh, the orbiter cabin, but the volume was appropriate, and it did allow uh, a sealed uh, environment for testing. It would take uh, a couple of PSI delta P's, about all it would take. We uh, uh, developed a... We, we did run it at 10 P's, 10.2. No. That was a different one. Different one. Yeah. We developed uh, an environmental control system uh, or an atmospheric revitalization control system uh, and it placed it inside to do uh, early testing. As you can see uh, here, this is the fan package, the uh, CO2 scrubbers are here, heat exchanger package over here, and you can tell we're uh, not current in terms of uh, calendar wise. Uh, <laughs> The uh, 
CO2 and uh, trace gas removal, uh, the requirements were to maintain less than 7.6 millimeters of mercury. Uh, this is a, certainly to provide a habitable in, environment for the crew. This is higher than, than sea level, but uh, uh, the medics uh, agreed that that was a completely adequate uh, uh, level for CO2. The uh, Sorry. The CO2 absorption came from the humidified cabin gas, so the system had to accommodate uh, that as a feed stream. The uh, absorbent selected was lithium hydroxide. Uh, the equation was a lithium hydroxide uh, reacted with the CO2 to, to produce lithium carbonate and water and heat. And this was a single-use system. Uh, it turns out that the lithium hydroxide was an old solution. Uh, the previous spacecraft had used the same solution. Uh, but pretty much uh, their solution uh, was uh, unique purchased uh, production of lithium hydroxide. When we entered the shuttle era, we uh, were hoping for a long duration. And the idea was to use the commercial products uh, to get away from special production. And so uh, we looked around, and the Navy was producing a screened special production run for their submarine. So there was a lot of uh, a lot of use there. So the production was reasonably up. So we decided to use the Navy grade. And uh, so we brought it in and put it in the test bed that I just showed you and did some tests, and it didn't work worth a darn. You notice the... the uh, the loops here show that our uh, canister, uh, use of the canister was much more rapid than we had hoped for. The nice, beautiful, uh, deep uh, uh, loops here are a process that we developed to screen the Navy Lyo so that we didn't have to create a new production uh, capability, but were able to test the Lyo that came off their production line and get a, a Lyo that was much more humidity tolerant. Uh, the, uh, this, the key here turned out to be not the chemical itself, but its ability to, uh, to uh, produce uh, good performance over uh, a wide humidity range. So we were able to screen that and, and, uh, and make that uh, a viable uh, uh, non-special production run Lyle. The uh, lithium hydroxide, I said, was an old solution. Uh, all previous spacecraft have been pretty short mission, and even the shuttle was a, a short mission. Uh, but the specification for shuttle said that it should uh, have the capability of going 28 days. And 28 days is not a short mission, at least not in shuttle parlance. Um, so uh, the, uh, the engineering uh, part of the organization said, well, why don't we go with a regenerative system? Skylab had just been successfully uh, flown with a regenerative system, uh, something we didn't have all this expendables, because 28 days worth of lithium hydroxide for seven crewmen fills everything up with lithium hydroxide. There's no room for anything else. Um, so we began to look at a regenerative system that uh, could uh, could be used. Actually, it was proposed as part of the original shuttle development, but uh, at that point, the 28-day uh, mission was considered uh, a special case, and the design case was was the shorter missions. And in fact, there were even projected to be a lot of short missions. The idea that the shuttle was a, a space truck that would take stuff up, dump it out, and come home. Uh, and so the lithium hydroxide was a lighter system than a regenerative system. Uh, so the, the lithium hydroxide was, was placed uh, into the vehicle as a basic design. Uh, but when Space Hab, Space Lab era came along, uh, we needed longer missions. Uh, we flew about four or five times in this 13 to 16 day range. Uh, and those missions did require uh, a lot of lithium hydroxide. And so it was proposed to use a, uh, an absorbent that was regenerable. And the one that was uh, selected uh, was a solid amine. The, uh, the absorbent is a polymerized uh, elephant ethylene uh, amine. Uh, its designation is RNH, and I don't really know why. The absorption actually comes in, in two steps. First is a reaction with water uh, to create the, uh, uh, the free ion, uh, and then that is then reacted with the CO2 to give you uh, uh, another free uh, ion but the CO2 is now captured. The desorption then with the heat and vacuum gives you back uh, your original amine. So if you pack this in a bed, and what we used was an expanded metal foam heat exchanger that you could fill all the holes with uh, the solid amine. Uh, 
and put the passages adjacent, adjacent to each other so that you could use the heat of absorption to do your desorption in your other side. And all you need to do is expose it to vacuum. So it was a very uh, simple system. Uh, was It worked fine for the four or five missions, three or four missions. I'm not sure how many missions it was used. Uh, but it was an adjunct. It was added in, put under the floor, and then it was taken back out uh, when it was no longer needed because it was just wasted uh, load. Yes? For the, the lithium hydroxide, mm -hmm. the, the product the LiCO3, is that a solid form, gas form? No, it's a, it's a solid lithium carbonate. Okay, and that it's goes in the canisters that you remove? Right. When you remove the canister, it's a big lump. Yes. Okay. Uh, Finishing up the uh, CO2 and trace removal, we go to the trace removal. We use simple, the simple system of uh, activated charcoal, and in fact, it's packed into the same uh, canister that the lithium hydroxide is packed into. Uh, it is a single use. Uh, there is a configuration, I believe, now operationally where the entire canister is uh, lithium hydroxide, I mean, is uh, activated charcoal, so it can be used for cabin gas cleanup. So if you had a, an issue that you needed to, to uh, clean the cabin up, you could do that. Uh, with a, with a canister of just uh, charcoal. The next uh, uh, area is uh, the environmental cooling and humidity control. I mentioned on the schematic that we have a cabin heat exchanger. Uh, the front part of the heat exchanger basically is your, uh, your you reduce the cabin gas temperature. Uh, the back end of the heat exchanger is where the condensing occurs because we get the gas below the dew point and therefore the water drops out. Uh, the heat exchanger uh, has the characteristic that uh, as the water collects at the, at the outlet of the heat exchanger, uh, there were some uh, holes drilled, actually, uh, in, the, uh, in the, the fin passages so the water can be sucked out. And it has the nickname Slurper, so it slurps the water out. Uh, it takes about 2% of the flow. Uh, so as the cabin fan produces the flow through the heat exchanger, about 2% is siphoned off in the Slurper. And that carries the water to the gas. The water. Looks like I don't learn. The uh, centrifugal water gas separator. Uh, this is a device that basically spins the airstream. It's an airstream with water entrained. It spins the airstream. The water goes to the outside. Uh, it's collected in a trough, and there's a pitot tube in the trough that the water Im impinges on, and we get about a 40 psi uh, delta head with that. It's just a pump, basically a pitot pump. The uh, atmospheric circulation and uh, ventilation is, uh, is the next part of the system. As you know, we're still in atmospheric uh, revitalization. Uh, there are the redundant fans that I mentioned. Each fan will do the job. Uh, there are also flight deck and mid-deck duct system. This is a picture of the, uh, of the duct system. It looks very complicated, but uh, the only several points I want to make here. This is the uh, atmospheric revitalization system I mentioned before. As you see, it's below the floor. This is the mid-deck here. This is the flight deck. So it's below the floor of the mid-deck. Uh, the uh, gas is uh, exits. Uh, the heat exchanger uh, goes up. There's some F, uh, some mid-deck, uh, F mid-deck uh, ventilation uh, exhaust. It goes on up and to the flight deck, exhaust on the flight deck. Uh, also, there is a section that goes uh, on the forward side of the cabin through the, the forward uh, control console and, and, uh, and blows in, in, in the face of the, of the crew. Uh, the return is back through uh, some avionics areas to provide cooling uh, and then back uh, down, to the, down to the system. So this is a complicated picture, but really it's a very simple uh, uh, flow system. This becomes important later in, in our discussion because good mixing turned out to be a really important parameter, not just cooling. Okay, the second, remember we had six, so this is the second element. This is the atmospheric pressure and composition control. Uh, the first job is the uh, 14.7. Shuttle uh, selected uh, uh, sea level, uh, the idea being uh, uh, we could not have a lot of special designed equipment. Uh, shuttle was intended to be a less expensive spacecraft than the previous ones, and so a sea level atmosphere gave us no questions about human survival.
successful and gave us a lot of opportunity for using uh, more standard equipment and not specially designed equipment. There was a requirement though uh, for an 8 PSI uh, total control, but this was only for an emergency deorbit. The problem statement is that you've got, gotten a hole in your cabin. Don't know how you got it, but you have it. And the idea is the system has to be able to sustain the crew for a deorbit. And I don't know who made up the number, but 169 minutes is the number. So we have an emergency return, 169 minutes. The system has to be able to accommodate that, keeping the pressure the total pressure at uh, uh, at or above 8 psi so there has to be enough flow capability enough consumables to do that uh, the half inch hole uh, was a programmatic decision uh, I can't speak for that where the number exactly came from but probably had to do with uh, uh, meteoroid uh, debris kind of a analysis that said what type of hole you could expect but anyway that was the design for the system uh, the next uh, aspect or element of the system is the O2 into partial pressure control. Uh, at the total pressure of 14.7, we wanted sea level, which is about 3.2 uh, psi oxygen. At the 8 psi, we wanted it to be survivable, uh, but the oxygen could be less. Obviously, people live in Denver, right? So it all works. Um, there are also crew breathing masks, which can be used in conjunction with uh, low uh, oxygen partial pressure. Uh, the cabin had to have both positive and negative relief. Uh, it uh, had to store the oxygen and nitrogen, and it had to provide pressurization for the water management system. Remember earlier I talked about the more pervasive requirements. Uh, the water and waste management system now is placing requirements on the atmospheric pressure and composition control. This is a silhouette again. Um, we're basically, uh, uh, here you see the uh, oxygen tank, which is 3,300 PSI oxygen tank. There's nitrogen tanks on both sides. Uh, these are high pressure tanks, all uh, 3,300 PSI. <coughs> the uh, relief valves are, are shown here. Um, and there is a O2 into supply panel, which has all of the valves and the regulators and, uh, and everything on it. Um, this uh, uh, system, however, though, gets most of its oxygen from the cryogenic tanks. So that is only just shown as an inlet. These tanks are basically part of the uh, uh, power control system. So electrical power is hydrogen or oxygen fuel cell. So we use a lot less oxygen than they do. So the storage, storage was integrated. And then we use the, uh, the oxygen for, for most, uh, uh, most of the uses. It comes from the main tanks. So this is a schematic. Uh, I'll start right there. This is the, the cryogenic system. Uh, this is the main cryogenic system. This is not part of the, the, uh, the tankage of, uh, of the pressure and composition control system. It goes through a restrictor. This is stored uh, in a supercritical state, so uh, the delivery is somewhat limited. Uh, and so this goes through a restrictor so that we don't uh, decrease the pressure too fast in the cryogenic tank. Uh, it comes on down through a regulator that regulates down to 100 uh, PSI, and that comes on down to two uh, regulators. One is the normal regulator, the 14.7, and the other is the 8 PSI regulator, uh, both of which uh, uh, are available for depending on which cabin mode uh, you're in. If you go over this way, you see the nitrogen. The nitrogen uh, goes through its own regulator, and it's regulated to 200 PSI, and that's important because that's contrasted to the 100 here. Next, the nitrogen goes through uh, an on-off valve, a, a solenoid that is connected to partial pressure sensors of oxygen, and then it goes to the same regulators. So, if you're making up cabin gas, you have to make a choice as to whether you want nitrogen or oxygen. And that choice is made by this uh, system and a simple on-off valve. So there's no sophisticated control system. This is a simple on-off valve. If the cabin needs pressure but doesn't need oxygen, uh, then this valve is open and the 200 PSI ba basically backs down the oxygen system. There's a check valve here. No oxygen flows. You get nitrogen. At the point that you need oxygen, this valve closes, then there is no 200 PSI anymore. Therefore, the 100 PSI provides oxygen to the regulators. So it's a very simple design. Off the top of your head, what kind of vein 
regulators did you have during file tests that really bothered you? The regulators were produced by uh, Carlton, uh, and uh, the, they had they had. The regulators were derivatives of regulators they've been building for years, so the regulator functions really were pretty good. But the early problems we had is that uh, the tolerance, pressure tolerance, uh, they had uh, they wandered and didn't have as good a pressure tolerance, and uh, they did make some mods to, to correct that. But the more significant issues got into uh, flow issues. Uh, their test capability was pretty limited, and uh, when you're talking about uh, very high flow cases, uh, you have to do something with the gas to make the regulator think that, that it's in an operational environment. And so we did a lot of testing, uh, and I'll show you that in just a second, uh, for, uh, for the high flow cases. Okay, let's see. Uh, there is a redundant system. It's not shown in this schematic, but there's, there are two of these, just like this. Uh, this is the pressurization for the water and waste management system you see here. Uh, let's see, and there is a crossover to the redundant system so that, that you can do mix and match if you have a problem in, in both systems. You can mix and match, mix and match the capabilities. Also, the, the oxygen system provides the emergency breathing system. It also provides uh, oxygen to the airlock for uh, uh, recharge of the backpack. We'll talk about that later. And I believe that's it. So for normal pressure, we have 14.7, and you have the, uh, the automatic pressure regulator, basically on-off valve and, and the regulator. The partial pressure uh, is controlled by the, the 3.2 PSI, uh, which is the, the, the solenoid that controls that. So it's a very, uh, a very simple system. The, uh, the oxygen partial pressure does have another set point at the 8 PSI. It goes down to 2.45 PSI, and I'll show you that in a minute. For cabin pressure relief, um, the problem statement really is, why do you need relief? Well, what if one of those lines breaks? You've got 3,300 PSI tankage. It's all plumbed together. Uh, the crew, God forbid, step on a line and break it, and, uh, and now you've got all this nitrogen rushing in, so you don't want the cabin to explode, right? So you need a regulator, I mean a, a relief valve. And the relief valve was set at 16.2. And again, uh, that's one of the high flow cases that, uh, that we ended up testing. Uh, the system was designed with three relief valves. Uh, any two will do the job. Uh, that's just a redundancy philosophy. Sometimes you'll see two items where both of them, either, either one does the job. In this case, uh, this is a very a critical issue, so uh, there is a double redundancy here. For the negative pressure protection, uh, there's an 8 PSI uh, delta uh, relief valve. In fact, there are three of those. You don't need but two to operate, but there are three. Uh, this is for the return that I just showed you. If you come back, a hole in the cabin, the cabin's at 8 PSI, uh, you can't reverse flow through that hole. That's not going to work. So you don't want the cabin imploding on the crew, so you've got to make up as you come in. The uh, lower altitudes, obviously, the higher pressure, you've got to get that gas back in the cabin. So that's what that's for. Okay, uh, this is the other pressure uh, vessel that was used as a test uh, site. This, uh, it was called an environmental test article. Uh, Rockwell gave it that name. Uh, what, what they planned to do with this uh, device when they built it uh, was to do all the wiring runs and the plumbing runs in there. It was going to be a mock-up. It turned out they built a rather beefy uh, tank. In fact, maybe they got one very inexpensively. I'm not sure where, how they ended up with it, but they got it. But they did do all the uh, secondary structure, so it had the right shape inside. And so uh, it turned out they didn't end up using it. Uh, they went on to other uh, methods. And so it ended up left over in the program. And uh, so we uh, convinced Aaron that he ought to give it to us. And uh, he did. Uh, this is what it looks like in cutaway. Uh, you see here all the secondary structure. It was in boxes, but we put it all in, foamed it in so that the volume was right, so the cabin volume was, was essentially perfect. Uh, it had the flight deck, it had the mid deck, it had the lower deck for the environmental control system. Well, we also asked Aaron to give us the CERT hardware, which, which he did. So uh, we had uh, the CERT uh, hardware uh, underneath the floor, and, uh, and the pressure control system we're talking about actually is on this back wall. That's a picture of it. 
what we did is faithfully run the lines. In fact, we even used the same line material, same fittings, same everything. So we faithfully duplicated inside this uh, test article uh, the volume and the geometry and the system. Uh, all the ventilation ducts you saw, all those were in place. Uh, we'll come back to it later, but you notice uh, on the back wall of the uh, uh, this test facility, you notice there's an airlock hatch, and later on I'll tell you where that goes. But this is the, the, uh, the, the control uh, panel and the nitrogen uh, system, uh, nitrogen oxygen system. Okay, this is uh, test data. Um, we did some testing to see how the system worked. Uh, this was testing of basically the on-off uh, oxygen control system. Uh, let's see if I can walk through this uh, simply. Uh, we're working total pressure here, uh, oxygen partial pressure here. Uh, during this first interval, the oxygen is on. Okay. So what we're doing here, we're breathing it down, and when we hit the lower limit, so that the regulator wants to do something, uh, when we hit that lower limit, uh, then the oxygen partial pressure starts up because the regulator comes on. Now the total pressure is maintained because that's what the regulator is supposed to do, maintain total pressure. But as it maintains the total pressure, it's doing it with oxygen and therefore the partial pressure is going up. When the nitrogen valve, uh, when, when it's satisfied, that's enough partial pressure of oxygen, uh, then the solenoid valve opens and you see the nitrogen come on. Now you remember the nitrogen feed was at 300 psi versus 200 psi. So there's a little jump. That's just a mechanical artifact of the regulator. If you change the inlet pressure, it regulates slightly differently because it's a balanced system. So you see a little jump there. Uh, and then during this period, uh, the pressure is maintained, but we're breathing off the oxygen because we've got the oxygen fenced off now. And then when the pressure is satisfied and the, the solenoid goes back the other way, then we again uh, start the oxygen again. So the system worked quite well. If you notice, the tolerance band spec-wise was pretty wide. The system operated in a very narrow band, so we're very pleased with that. Uh, normally that's important, not only because it shows you that you do have a, a good sensitive system, but you can't, mechanical hardware, electrical hardware, either one, never operates down the middle always. There, there's, there's drift. So you need a little tolerance in your band here to, uh, to have a decent system design. Yes, sorry. Does this change a lot when you have the crew uh, performing high metabolic activity? The cabin is so large that it really doesn't know. The cycles would be, uh, they would be different, obviously, because you consume more oxygen, you would need more oxygen, so the, the on-off cycle would favor uh, longer oxygen cycles. But in the big picture, there's really not a, uh, a lot of change. You might have, I don't, what was this time period? Uh, it looks like this was about three, three hours, maybe? So that might go to two hours for a cycle. I mean, not really very much. Uh, we're still in the uh, atmospheric... Per Sorry. Does uh, microgravity have much effect on circulation? There is no circulation in microgravity. Okay, so... <laughs> it just lays there. So you just need... It's all... From you edge. push it or it doesn't go. That's right. Uh, the, there is, diffusion is a driving force, so if you're really, really patient, even in zero-g, you can wait. <laughs> but you can't stay alive that way. <laughs> but, but uh, yes, you do have to have ventilation. Um, okay, still in the atmospheric pressure and composition control. This is the emergency breathing equipment. We used a plug-in face mask. Uh, there are uh, some uses for the mask that require a carry-on bottle to give portability, but in the, the vehicle does have plug-in capability. The masks were purge-type masks, so you're probably not familiar much with, uh, with masks, but uh, there's a mask called a rebreather, which basically your lung power does all the work and you only purge enough to keep the CO2 down and you keep rebreathing. And then the purge type says every breath is a fresh breath. And uh, you then exhale and the, and the gas goes out in the cabin. And that's the type that this is because the cabin needs the oxygen. I mean, it's not going anywhere bad. It's, it's okay that it's not completely spent. It's, it's good. That's like a scoop mask, right? Um, scuba valve. Um, don't scuba. Oh, okay. Sorry. Well, I think the answer is yes. It's scuba, you take in the air and then you blow it all out. Unless, I mean, there are scuba rebreathing systems, but they're, the 
uh, you know, the typical squeaky my ear is, is low. Okay. It, rather than raising your hand, if you'd make a uh, noise of some kind, I'm sorry, I don't mean to ignore you. Um, the uh, mask can be used in a contaminated environment, and the mask can be used uh, if the concentration of O2 is uh, low to give you uh, a better uh, oxygen level. Uh, this is the APSI uh, test that we did, uh, actually a series of tests, but this is data from one. As you see, we started up uh, in the 14.7 range. We simulated the hole. The pressure immediately starts down. Uh, the partial pressure of oxygen we let uh, uh, degrade to about the 2.2 uh, range. Uh, this is a, a different set point. You remember I told you on the oxygen sensors we have two set points. This is the second set point. And so we have a lower oxygen partial pressure. Uh, the system came down. The uh, APSI regulator, which is always online, captured the, the, the pressure decay, caught it. Uh, the solenoid valve popped back and forth to keep the oxygen okay because we're losing now. We're going out this half inch hole. And the system worked just fine. This uh, did have the Corona masks because that, that's livable. You can live there, but, but the mask is a better environment. So this is a mask case. Okay. This was a requirement that came on later. The design is the design now. The vehicle exists. So we have to now uh, operate that vehicle with uh, accommodations for whatever operationally uh, we want to do with it. And a new requirement uh, developed uh, and was imposed on the vehicle. And that requirement had to do with the spacesuit, with EVA operation. The shuttle spacesuits are basically 100% O2. And the classical way of going EVA from a sea level environment was a four hour pre-breathe, actually as much as six hours depending on the, uh, how conservative the medics were at the time. The, that, that number varied around some uh, to prevent bends. Uh, but it was determined that if you acclimatized at 9 PSI for about 12 hours, then you only required a really short pre-breathe. And the suit-up time, which gave you 30 to 40 minutes, uh, actually gave you sort of a free tune-up to your pre-breathe as part of your suit-up operation. Uh, and so that was viewed as a much better way to do EVAs than, than the previous way. Uh, the masks uh, are useful but they're not very comfortable. So if you have to keep them on for a long period of time, they're not very comfortable at all. Also, the medics were very concerned about mass leakage, that if there was any inflow, uh, nitrogen inflow, that that could uh, break the pre-breathe. But our system isn't designed for nine. We have a, a 14, seven, and an eight, but we don't have a nine. So we needed a manual procedure. But before that could be accepted, there were some issues that had to be uh, evaluated, and we had to do testing uh, on each of these issues. Uh, the first is the flow rate acceptability at 9 PSI. Obviously the less dense gas, you're not going to get the same mass flow uh, rate. And we had to make sure that the, that, that ventilation was going to be adequate and uh, testing proved that, uh, that, it, that it was. The next is the thermal acceptability. There are really two aspects to this. One is the fan itself is cooled by the environment. So if the environment uh, doesn't provide as much cooling, the fan itself could overheat. Uh, also, the uh, electronic equipment, some of which is, uh, is air-cooled, uh, the less dense gas could be a problem there. It turned out that could be controlled with uh, load control. They could uh, offload power and, uh, and make that acceptable. The CO2 performance at 9 PSI, we needed to make sure that was okay. Uh, it turned out that, of course, the 8 PSI case, we don't care about the lithium hydroxide. The purge flow is so great, there is no CO2 problem. But at 9 PSI for 12 hours, you have to get performance out of the lithium hydroxide. So we checked that, and that worked out fine. And the last item was the ventilation uh, adequacy. We do have a press and depress. You've got to come down to 9, and you've got to go back. And both of those adjust the gas mixture. And so uh, we wanted to prove that that was okay. And so we went to the, the facility that we were talking about uh, and ran this profile. Now this profile was created by our, uh, yes? Uh, originally you said a lot of the shuttle equipment was designed for the now you didn't want to change that. But now, now that you've brought EVA, you lower the pressure, does that affect the equipment? Uh, well, that, that's what I just said. Yes, it does. The air-cooled equipment uh, uh, is going to run hot. 
So if, if you want to cool that equipment, uh, it'll become a little clearer later, but the equipment is, is in bays, equipment bays, and so if with the less dense gas, you need to have some of that equipment turned off so that the cooling that is available is adequate. So you do, you do load control, get rid of some of the electronics, and therefore the air that's left, or the atmosphere that's left, can cool the, the equipment. And then when do you increase the pressure back to normal after the EVA? A after the 12 hours. No, actually it's before the EVA. Well, I'm not sure what they do now. I think uh, right now... When you're all finished with your EVAs, then, then you bring the cabin back. Because typically, you do multiple EVAs, and so from one day to the next, you just keep the cabin. At, and it, actually, we use 10.2 now. I think yes. Rather than nine. Right. But I think you have to certify it for nine. This was, a, this was an early certification uh, for nine. Okay. Would it, would it yes. Would it have been easier to design, simply design the whole system for nine from the beginning if you had me? Well, this was not a shuttle requirement. This was an operational requirement that occurred uh, after the shuttle specifications were set. You're correct. If, you have had if we knew it ahead of time, it yes. It would have been much easier to do it over nine PSIs. Exactly. Exactly. It would have just been a third condition. But as, uh, as Jeff pointed out, we changed our mind. Uh, the first was nine, and now we're at ten point two. So we don't. Uh, we're not consistent. As we learn, we change our mind, and uh, the ten point two was selected later. Okay, our uh, uh, mission operations people that do the crew timelining and all, they created this uh, procedure, and so we tested it. This has a, a simple depress cycle. You come from 14.7, you hesitate at about 11 and, and replenish the oxygen. Uh, you do that twice. You then do manual control down at the, uh, the 9 PSI level. Uh, you notice the uh, oxygen partial pressure here uh, is always maintained. Uh, by uh, these these uh, adjustments and also during the manual period you select what you want and then when you come back uh, the procedure was to uh, increase the nitrogen and then finish the top off uh, with oxygen that was thought to be uh, completely acceptable because the uh, the oxygen level at this point uh, is completely viable and so uh, include uh, doing the nitrogen first and topping it off with oxygen was thought to be an acceptable way to to operate. So we did the test uh, and this is uh, what happened. Uh, we were all nice and comfortable with our oxygen partial pressure and you see the area next to where we were uh, uh, repressing uh, we, we depleted the oxygen substantially and the uh, mid deck and even the flight deck we depleted the oxygen and uh, I've only shown you half the data so if you look at the rest of the data, you see where the oxygen went. These equipment bays that I mentioned earlier, the avionics bays and uh, other equipment bays, are basically uh, isolated volumes from the cabin. So as the pressure uh, comes up, what you're doing is you're pressurizing these areas with cabin gas, which is oxygen and nitrogen. You're pressurizing these areas with nitrogen only. So basically, you're depleting the partial pressure here. You're increasing the partial pressure here. You remember partial pressure, you just count the molecules. That's all you have to do. So basically, we're putting more oxygen molecules here, and we're taking them out of the, these areas, and therefore, they're going down. So we developed uh, these. This is this picture of, a, of one of the bays. You see all the empty space around the equipment. That's where the gas is. So we came up with an alternate procedure, which is to simultaneously put the oxygen and nitrogen in together. And of course, there's the, the uh, 9 back to 14.7. And you notice that that solved the problem. Uh, there's still some dip uh, at the supply area because the mixture's lean. We need uh, from 9 to 14.7, what, 5.7 psi total pressure increase, but we only need uh, 2.5 up to 3.2 oxygen. So this is a, it's a mixture, but it's a lean mixture. So there's still some slight loss, but the only area that came uh, under uh, uh, an issue is near the, the inlet where the O2 N2 supply panel is, and of course you can just avoid that area. Well, I, I should say that that area happens to be right around the bathroom. And so before we re 
repressurize the shuttle, the commander would get anybody who has to use the bathroom use it now because you know for about 10 15 minutes while we're repressurizing it's off limits. <laughs> okay, the next item. Uh, this is the uh, uh, water and waste management area. Uh, this is one of one of the six uh, items. We have uh, potable and wastewater inventory management. Uh, we're continually producing potable water, as you know, and wastewater. Uh, we have to dump them, we have to use them, so that, that is part of the, the requirement of this system. Uh, we have to store water for drinking, food prep, uh, waste, wastewater uh, storage has to be uh, dumped to space, uh, commode and urinal for human waste collection, and uh, we provide water for a, an evaporative heat sink, which we'll talk about later, called the flash evaporator. Yes. This is an outstanding example of systems engineering, this total system that Walt's talking about. You can really see the interaction between all the systems and the spacecraft. It really is a, a systems engineering problem. Okay. Uh, potable water, uh, we take all the fuel cell byproduct water uh, and uh, use it, so it, it's basically an affluent to the power system. We do have a launch storage capability for water, uh, and we do uh, uh, provide sterilization. The sterilization is uh, iodine. We started out uh, using a, or designing a silver ion system. Uh, it turned out that uh, we had manufacturing problems and the company uh, ended up going out of business, and uh, so we reverted to iodine. The, the lunar module used iodine. Uh, wastewater, the condensate from the cabin humidity control, uh, and urine and a urine pretreat. Uh, the uh, urine has to be pretreated uh, to to uh, bind the urea. If you don't, you get a lot of ammonia. Uh, it uses a chemical called o oxone, O X Z O N E, I think. Uh, it's an acid. I'm not really sure what it is. Okay, this is where the system's located. Uh, this is one of the more, uh, the simpler schematics. Uh, the water tanks uh, here, uh, the water comes from the fuel cell, as I said. It goes, by the way, the, the, the delivery is about uh, 150 PSI. Uh, and, um, excuse me, 150 degrees and uh, 60 PSI. So there is a lot of hydrogen dissolved in the water. The water is collected on the, in the fuel cells on the hydrogen side. So there's a lot of hydrogen. So there's a, a hydrogen separator here. Otherwise, your tanks would end up full of hydrogen, which is what you don't want. Uh, you want water in the tanks. So the hydrogen separator is a, a silver palladium metal. Uh, it's catalyzed. It's basically porous to hydrogen, but not to water. If you expose the backside to the vacuum, it pulls the hydrogen off, and the water goes through just fine. Uh, I will say that there still is a rather high gas content in the water that you drink. And that gas, of course, evolves once it gets inside your stomach with predictable results. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, in fact, uh, all sorts of systems that uh, Jeff could explain, they have slinger systems and all sorts of systems to get, uh, get separation because it's not really possible to get uh, all the gas out of the water. Okay, uh, there's a, a dump system, there's a portable uh, dump to vacuum, a waste dump to vacuum, uh, there's also a vacuum vent, uh, which I'll show you what that's all about. And then the flash evaporator that I mentioned, and I'll mention more later, is in the back of the vehicle, and it has a redundant water feed system, both sides. Okay, this is a schematic. Start at the same place, water from the fuel cells, goes through the uh, hydrogen separator, and then into this bank of tanks. The tanks are pressurized on the, their uh, uh, metal bellows tanks. On the back side of the bellows is nitrogen, on the, the forward side, of course, is the, the, the potable water. Uh, there is a hydrophobic filter on each side, on the downside of each tank. If uh, a, a bellows were to leak, you don't want water into your nitrogen system, so this is a filter to prevent that. Uh, I mentioned the twin flash evaporator feeds. There they are. This is the dump nozzle here. Uh, the potable water system provides water to the crew, so there's a, a regular water interface and a chill water interface here. I believe that's it. Uh, 
I, I don't have those sorted mentally. I'm sorry. I don't remember. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Yes. yes. The slender. What do we use the slender? Do we use the slender Apollo or the shuttle? Maybe that was an Apollo. No, no, we had a shuttle. In the shuttle. I get confused. Basically, that means you, you, you put your, your water into a plastic bag, and now you can actually sling it around like so, and so the water will go to the outside and the gas is in the inside, so that effort actually separates, and then you can squeeze the gas out through a, through a valve. Okay. Uh on orbit trash storage, uh, there is a, an overboard bleed for odor control. It's a very small uh, overboard bleed to vacuum. And the human solid waste collection and storage, uh, that's also vacuum dried and stabilized. This is a waste management picture. Uh, the subject we are just talking about is the uh, vacuum vent. Uh, the vacuum vent does vent the, uh, the commode area where the, the feces are. That vent also provides a vent for the water separator. It also provides a vent for airlock uh, depress for EVA. So this is uh, the vacuum system. The uh, urine is collected uh, and trained in a, uh, a liquid, uh, well, let me say that differently. The urine is, after it's been separated from the, the gas stream, is uh, stored in a waste tank, as is the humidity from the, uh, the cabin uh, thermal, uh, the uh, atmospheric revitalization system. Uh, and, and then that is pressurized from the uh, pressure and composition control system and it's dumped overboard. There's This water is not used for anything. It's basically dumped just to do uh, inventory management. Uh, the next picture explains a little better about the, uh, the commode and the urinal, urinal themselves. Uh, the urinal uh, originally had a uh, unisex uh, uh, interface cup. Uh, it turned out that that uh, didn't work very well. Uh, and so later flights, uh, there was a, a custom male-female, and later there were even some more customizing for the crew, I believe. Uh, but uh, I don't have the details on that. But the urinal itself, obviously, uh, for a urination, there needs to be some way to, to make the urine uh, go where you want it to go. And those were done in... Uh, uh, a fan separators so there is gas pulled in uh, in the cup and in training the urine the urine then comes down and goes through the uh, the separators this is also a centrifugal uh, type separator uh, and then that's sent to the the head that's created here then puts that uh, uh, wastewater urine in the uh, in the waste system uh, the EMU uh, spacesuit, uh, it also has a condensate drain uh, after, each e after each EVA, and it also goes through the same system and into the waste tank. The commode uh, is basically, uh, there's a seat. Uh, the seat has uh, a, a small opening. The uh, commode itself is basically a, a cylinder or a tub. And there's a slinger in the bottom. So the slinger basically distributes the paper and the fecal matter on the outside wall in a thin layer. Uh, the vacuum then can dry that so that it deactivates it so it does not uh, uh, end up either uh, any odor or creating any kind of uh, bacteriological issues. Uh, but the entrainment of the fecal material so that it, in fact, uh, hits the slinger is done with a, an airflow. The airflow comes in around the, the seat itself. Uh, that requires a, a good contact with the seat. It also requires uh, positioning. It turned out that positioning turned out to be an early <coughs> issue or reliable positioning. And so uh, a trainer was put together that, uh, that had a camera here. <laughs> and uh, the trainer, I might add, was uh, discreetly uh, located in a, in a, a non-observable place so that uh, it could be used uh, in privacy, uh, the comings and goings, and also the use of the facility itself. And they told us that it was not hooked up to a tape recorder. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway,
anyway, I think uh, that... Just to, to elaborate on that, basically the, the problem, it, it really is a, a rather small opening, and, and it just doesn't feel natural to know where to put yourself down. And, and it actually did lead to significant messes on orbit. I won't go into any more detail, but the idea is, is that you would position yourself the way you thought it should be, and then you turn on the lights, and there's a TV screen in front of you. I'm not making this up. <laughs> so that you could, you could see how close you are to the bullseye. <laughs> Enough said. Okay. Uh, the cabin thermal control is uh, another one of the subsystem elements. Uh, it's a circulating liquid cooling system. It provides the, uh, the heat sink for the atmosphere itself. Uh, it also provides the ability to reject that heat to the spacecraft cooling system because you've got to get rid of it out of the cabin. It has some avionics cold plates, some air-cooled avionics, uh, support the crew in the airlock, and a portable, portable water chiller. This is the location. Uh, you notice the the uh, F the avionics bays are, are listed here with their little uh, uh, circulation systems. Uh, the liquid system then services each of those. The chiller, the condensing heat exchanger, and this is the place that the cabin system connects to the spacecraft system is on the aft bulkhead right here. We'll see the other half of this system in a little bit. This is schematic. It's very complicated looking, but it's, it's uh, fairly simple. Uh, let me show you the air piece first. Look at the black lines. There's a twin fans, goes through the air-cooled avionics, through the heat exchanger to get rid of the heat. There are some cold-plated uh, avionics in each bay, so you take care of the cold-plated and the air-cooled in this bay, in this bay, and in this bay. So now you've got all the electronics taken care of. That coolant loop then uh, has to service, I should have started this up at the pump, sorry about that. Here's the pump, come down. Also uh, takes care of the uh, forward and overhead window mounts around the window for thermal control and the hatch. Uh, it's just a uh, way to keep those uh, thermally stabilized. Back in the early flights, we had something called DFI, a Development Flight Instrumentation. It was a special instrumentation package. It was also uh, liquid cooled. And then this is the uh, heat exchanger to the spacecraft system. It's a Freon system. This is where the main heat's rejected right here. So on the other side of this, you've got cool liquid. Uh, turns out this is water. Uh, we go through the liquid cooling garment, which is the, the spacesuit uh, heat, uh, cooling garment, the water chiller, go through the cabin heat exchanger to cool the cabin and condense the water out, uh, and then back to the pump. I failed to mention the IMU. It has triply redundant fans, pulls air through it, and that's also cooled by this, uh, this gas stream. So anyway, this is the uh, cabin thermal control system. Uh, these functions, uh, I just said uh, each one of them, I won't repeat them. Uh, cabin circulating liquid cooling loop. As I mentioned, uh, water is the coolant. Water is actually, actually a very good coolant. And if you have any uh, requirements that push you that way in your designing thermal control systems, you like water. Uh, water is completely non-toxic, so it can be around the crew. Uh, leaks don't make any difference. Uh, uh, has a very high uh, CP. It's, it's a really good fluid. Problem with water is freezing. You don't want to freeze it, and you don't want to get it so hot that it turns into steam. But if you can stay within the boundaries, it's a good fluid, and that's what this this is. Uh, redundant pumps. I showed you that on the schematic. The uh, liquid gas heat exchanger showed you uh, that uh, before. Cold plates for electronic cooling and the window hatch mount. The circulating gases that I mentioned for the avionics, uh, the cabin gas was used as a coolant. Uh, you saw the redundant fans and the doubly redundant fans. Uh, I mentioned earlier, and someone else, uh, someone commented on it, that the promise early on was uh, the shuttle could be a less expensive development activity if uh, if we used off-the-shelf avionics, the kind that aircraft use. Uh, and that's a good promise. It turned out that, uh, that that's not a very good, uh, not as good, a solution for thermal control as liquid-cooled. Liquid-cooled is a much more efficient way of, uh, of providing a heat sink to uh, electrical equipment. Uh, 
when you blow the cabin gas through it, then you end, it, end up with the problems of if you change the pressure in the cabin, which we've talked about, that can affect cooling. Uh, it's also, uh, you have to pull out a lot more power. It takes, you have to blow a lot more gas than you do power to, to move the liquid around. So it's not a very good thermal solution. And actually, the promise of uh, less expensive avionics I don't think was actually fulfilled, although that's somebody else's topic and not mine, because I think everything was pretty well custom. Uh, so it, it did uh, potentially complicate the thermal control system uh, for a good goal, and uh, how well that goal was met, somebody else will have to speak for. Another uh, one of the uh, subsystem elements, the spacecraft. Uh, well, why don't we usually take a oh, minute break and certainly. we're about halfway through, so why don't, why don't we uh, take our two minutes now and then we'll, we'll pick right back up. Everybody, yes. I had one quick question just about what you were saying before the electronics and the by air flow in the first place. You know, what you use for that. From, from an engineering standpoint, uh, it's much better to cool with liquid. So if you use cold plates, it's much more efficient. You get a, a good, reliable heat sink, uh, and you can then design your thermal conduction path so that out of the avionics box, you make sure the heat goes to the cold plate, and you and use a lot less power. You can pump water a lot more efficiently for the cooling capability than you can pump gas. Gotcha. Okay. So is that what actually happens in the shuttle now, or do you have a mixture of both vehicles and both? Sorry, the, did you see what I was pointing out here? Yeah, and there's this is this is one bay, and they have both cold plates and uh, the air cooled uh, here, here, and here. There, there. Of course, when you go outside the vehicle, there's no more air, so all the external equipment's cold plated. Was there another question? Yes, sir. I was, I was mm -hmm. just saying. Uh, now what, what kind of design changes do you have to make in order to strictly take liquid-cooled electronics? Well, if you're trying to use off-the-shelf, and it's air-cooled already, there's a cabinet right there full of it. Right. If it's air-cooled already, then you have to stay with that concept. If you're custom designing, then from the very beginning you say, I'm custom designing this to be liquid-cooled, and then the internal design is such that there are conduction paths to the base plate so that it can be cooled. Okay, let's see if I can... I guess previous to that, all of our spacecraft were Apollo was liquid. Cool, yes. Right? Because you, you had to be able to take those spacecraft and the vacuum. Yeah. Right. Um, we evacuated the cabin both yeah. in the command module and the lunar module. Okay. And Jim, Jim, me too. Okay, here we are. Uh, this is the uh, spacecraft active thermal control system. Uh, this is the vehicle level, so that we're now, even though we're still under this ETC-LSS, uh, we're not talking the classical environmental control anymore. This is a bigger picture. Uh, also, the reason the word active is, is stuck in here was a, a leftover from, uh, from previous programs, too. Uh, for example, on Apollo, uh, we had uh, several heat rejection systems, not a single one. And we also did a lot of passive thermal control on Apollo. Uh, we had a, a mission mode called barbecue, which is basically you roll the vehicle very slowly, so you uh, normalize the, the uh, environment. If you leave the same side toward the sun all the way to the moon, that side gets really hot. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is the active system to, to get away from heaters and our vehicle level control. 
Okay, there's an on orbit. We have a radiative heat sink. We also have an evaporative heat sink on orbit. During ascent entry, we have two heat sinks, uh, both of which are evaporative. Uh, we have a circulating liquid system. Uh, we take heat from the cabin, from the fuel cells, hydraulics, all the cold plate avionics, uh, electronics, and uh, payloads. We do cooling for payloads. So all of these are the functions of the uh, active thermal control system. I don't know why. There it is. Uh, this, as you notice, is a lot busier than some of the others have been. Uh, you notice the radiators here on the sidewall. Uh, this is the doors. When closed up, there are no radiators. When open, the underside of the payload bay doors are your radiators. And it's on both sides, obviously. Uh, that same heat exchanger that I showed you before that interfaces with the cabin is right here. So the cabin load is dumped there. Uh, fuel cell load is dumped here. Uh, the fluid is a Freon 21. There's a Freon 21 pump package. The payload heat exchanger is here, I, be here, I believe. Uh, Mid-body cold plates, aft cold plates. Uh, each radiator side has its own flow control system. The evaporative heat sinks, one is the flash evaporator that I've shown you a couple of times before. I'll describe a little better in a minute. Uh, is here. It uses water. There's an ammonia boiler here that uh, is also an evaporative heat sink. And when we're on the ground, there's a GSE uh, connector for the GSE well, heat sink. More than you would ever know. Uh, in fact, this is the, the most complicated integrated thermal test to ever run at JSC. And I'll, I'll show you a picture of it in a minute. We actually tested all of that together. And it all had to work together. And it gets worse as we go along. I'll show you all the integration factors as we go along. But it changes from mission mode to mission mode. It changes within mission modes as to how the system works. And I'll try to describe that. Okay, so this sort of gives you the, the feel. Now, uh, keep in mind geometry is going to play a, an effect here uh, as to how you uh, plumb the system up. So all the all of Freon is running through all of those lines there all to the radiators? Right. Okay. It'll be a little clearer in a minute. Uh, okay, this is, a, this is a schematic. Let's start at the radiators. On a good day, this is doing the job for you. All the radiators are getting you nice, cool liquid. The radiator uses a bypass system, so that you see the bypass around the radiators. Uh, it's good to remind uh, yourselves that that the heat load can be tremendously different in high high mission high level mission phases. A lot of electronics, a lot of crew activity, a lot of the vehicle is alive and pumping out the power and therefore pumping out the heat. Uh, if you ever did one of those 28-day missions we talked about, which was a spec requirement, you can imagine this vehicle is almost quiescent. It's doing very little. Uh, you're trying to lengthen the mission, so you're not you're you're doing hopefully experiments or something in space lab or space lab. You're doing something else. You're not really uh, the vehicle is not working for you very hard. Just as an example, you know we have five computers and we use all five during ascent and entry the active phases for safety. But once you're on orbit, when you have a long mission like that, you actually power down all but two of the computers. That's just it. And there's a lot of other systems which you power down and that way. You, you're limited in many missions by the electrical energy, which is limited by the amount of hydrogen and oxygen you can carry for your fuel cells. So by powering down, you extend your mission, and of course you'll also reduce the heat load. And when you reduce the heat load, you've got to find some way to make that same radiator work for you at a very low heat load. So it has the capability of getting rid of a lot of heat. If you don't want it to get rid of that much heat because you don't have it, then you have to go to a bypass system. Anyway, the next thing in the loop is the GSE heat exchanger. So on the ground, you don't have radiators working, so you use the, uh, the GSE heat exchanger. Then there's the ammonia boiler. When, when you uh, re-enter, uh, the ammonia boiler gives you the ability to uh, operate with an evaporative heat sink prior to the, the uh, connection of the GSE. Uh, and so it's, it's part of the, the uh, thermal control system. The next is the flash evaporator. And you notice there are two uh, 
flash chambers here. One's called the high load, one's called the topper, and I'll talk about that a little more later. Uh, then the, the nice cool liquid, however it was cooled, all these cool it, however it was cooled is then available for the vehicle. And there is one more little heat load, and that's that cryogenic oxygen that we're bringing in. Uh, we also warm it up uh, with this coolant loop. So the, the, uh, the flow then goes to the aft cold plates, and then the flow also goes to the cabin heat exchanger and the payload heat exchanger. You notice these are either or. And that's because sometimes you don't even have a payload heat exchanger use, so you don't use it. Sometimes you have a lot of use for it, and maybe, for example, a space lab, a space lab, space have kind of an arrangement. You wouldn't be in the cabin as much, so you can divert that. So it allows you to use the capacity in either of two places here. Then you come on down and come through your pumping package, those redundant pumps. And then you go to the fuel cell heat exchanger, because now you've used the uh, uh, the good, uh, the cold fluid up, <clears throat> and uh, and so the fuel cell can stand to warmer temperatures. Also, some cold plates. Now, it might have occurred to you, occurred to me, why did we waste our nice cold fluid on these cold plates? Why don't we put those cold plates down here so we could have had more cold fluid for our cabin heat exchangers? And the answer is geometry. Those are way in the back. The, uh, the cabin is in the front, so after you've come forward from the flash evaporator, which is in the back, to the cabin, you don't want to go back to pick this up. So you wouldn't want to have to go back to the back of the vehicle and then back forward again. So this is a geometry problem. So we have cold plates here, we also have cold plates here. We come forward, and there's a, the hydraulic seat exchanger is the last thing on the loop, and then back to the radiators. We'll talk about that a little more. The uh, functions of the uh, active thermal control system uh, collect the waste energy from all the systems. We just talked about that and reject it radiatively to space. That's our first choice. Our first choice is to use the radiators. It turns out that the radiators in some heat load environments uh, don't do the job. Uh, you have a high load and a bad environment, uh, you can't get rid of all the heat. Also, we're producing a lot of water, so something constructive has to be done with this water. The fuel cells are pumping it out because every time you make a kilowatt, you've got more water to use. So we decided to augment the space radiators with the evaporative heat sink at these high load cases. This gives us an ability to accept a radiator system that uh, that can't really do the job by itself, but make it uh, completely adequate for some of the low heat load cases. But in the high heat load cases, then it, it's uh, augmented by uh, water. Now, when you want to get rid of water and you don't have some of this bad environment, you can actually throttle the radiators down. And if you throttle them down, then you force the evaporative heat sink to come online and do the job for you. So in other words, you, you, you change the set point on the radiator. Normally we use 40 degrees set point. If you change it to 56 degrees and let the water take you from 56 back down to 40, then you artificially get rid of water. So it's a good water dump system. During uh, ascent, uh, over 100,000 feet, uh, we use a water boiler, a flash evaporator, not a water boiler. That's a Freudian slip, I guess. The Apollo had what's called a water boiler. It was a nightmare. We said, never will we do that again. So we ended up with a different design for the shuttle. The uh, uh, reentry uh, system uh, below 100,000 feet is ammonia. Uh, it'll carry you all the way to the ground and on the ground until you get to GSE. Uh, water won't carry you because water won't evaporate less than 100,000 feet, but the ammonia will. So that's the reason it's there. Okay, let's talk about the radiators themselves. The, uh, the two payload bay doors are a mirror image of each other. So there are radiators on each side that are exactly mirror image. Um, I don't know what happened there. Anyway, this is supposed to say that the, that the radiators on these two sides are uh, mounted in, are, are plumbed in two separate uh, cooling loops. The reason for that is if you ran, uh, there's always a redundant loop, obviously. You have to be able to take a failure and still have a good system. If you run both loops through both radiator sides and you took some sort of a collision hit, 
then you could wipe out both of your cooling loops in one hit. And so that's unacceptable. So by plumbing the systems up with mirror image radiator systems on different loops, then you, you can still use the capacity together. But if you lose one side, you still have half your capacity left, and plus you have your evaporative heat sinks to make up the difference. So we can survive with a, with a, a, a panel, a door out. Uh, I mentioned the dual set points uh, before. I also mentioned the bypass thermal control. Uh, I, I mentioned the dual set points, uh, 40 and 56. 40 is our normal. If you're trying to burn up some water, you go to 56 and you use the difference in water. Uh, the radiators, uh, we have two different uh, kinds of radiators. We have the single-sided, they were on the back of the vehicle, and some two-sided ones on the front of the vehicle. The reason for that is when you open, when you open the door, when you open the door, you expose the underside of the door. Uh, if you have radiators on the underside of the door, then you've exposed your radiators. But if you lift the radiator panel off the door, because the doors go way down, like going, if you lift the panel off the door, then you can see the underside. It's not as good. Don't get a full view of heavens, but it does get rid of heat. And so we have, uh, we needed that extra capacity. So on the front four panels, uh, they're the two-sided, and on the back four, they're single-sided. The radiators themselves are made out of a honeycomb aluminum structure. Now, the tubes were embedded in the structure uh, so that the surface was smooth, and that was because we wanted to use a silver Teflon uh, tape for our thermal control coating. Uh, for previous vehicles, we'd always painted the radiators, painted them white. Uh, if you, you look at the uh, uh, Alpha Epsilon uh, white paint, it's pretty good. It's about, I think Apollo was 0.18 uh, uh, Alpha and Epsilon about 0 0.92. It's pretty good. Uh, the market uh, had moved along. Technology had, helped, had advanced and there was now the silver Teflon uh, uh, a, uh, out, out there. And what the silver Teflon does is the silver gives you the reflection, which is good, and the Teflon gives you the re radiation, which is good. So you get the best of both worlds. So uh, silver Teflon was about 0.05 Epsilon and about uh, uh, 0.88, 0.9, something like that. So you lost a slight amount in uh, Epsilon and gained a lot in Alpha. So basically you could ignore the sun, which is what you'd like to do, is ignore the sun. Uh, it turned out the silver Teflon had some issues. Uh, we tested the radiators. Uh, the radiator was, was not a, a slam dunk. Uh, with eight panels, four, excuse me, eight panels, four of which are two-sided, effectively you have uh, 12 panels, you have fluid going through those in parallel tubes. You're trying to uh, guarantee that the fluid all goes where it's supposed to go, uh, and therefore the the uh, viscosity of Freon, which is very low, uh, analytically said it was all right, but we wanted some testing to prove it. So uh, we did test the entire radiator system. Uh, and in that test, all the silver Teflon fell off. <laughs> so I <it> said <laughs> it's a really good uh, thermal coating, but it doesn't seem to be very practical. It turned out that the problem was adhesive. So uh, we did a little adhesive work, and uh, the, the materials people came up with a permacell that worked perfectly. They've never come off again. In fact, we get 10, 12 years out of the radiators. We don't, lots, lots of time. The problem that, that the permacell couldn't solve was beneath the, uh, the tape, you could get very small little uh, outgassing of the materials. But all materials, almost all materials, outgas some. So basically, it would, would put bubbles underneath the tape. So we went to a, 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 a perforated. So there are millions of little holes in this tape. And uh, it's placed uh, on the vehicle, and, uh, and it stayed on just fine. It wasn't very long, though, that people began to worry about the focusing of this silver, that the doors are curved upward, and so there's a focal point there that is a very, very hot point. And it was concerned that that's really not a, a good thing to have. So if we could make the surface uh, less specular and more diffuse without losing uh, the alpha and epsilon, we'd have a better design. And so they dimpled it. So now we have permacell, dimpled, perforated silver Teflon tape. <laughs> Works great. <laughs> okay. Uh, the flash evaporator. This is a uh, water is the, is the 
flash evaporators uh, evaporant. Uh, this was a brand new design. Uh, the water boiler on Apollo was no good. It was a problem. Uh, the flash evaporator is a very simple concept. You have a chamber, you run your coolant around the chamber that you want to be cooled, and you spray water on the walls of the chamber. And if the pressures are all right, the water will flash. Uh, you won't get liquid. It'll uh, it'll go straight to. Uh, I mean, you won't get ice. It'll go straight to steam. Steam will go overboard, and it'll all be wonderful. And if you can convince a program manager of that, <laughs> good luck. But anyway, the way to convince the program manager is to show them good test data. So during the development, we developed this process of spraying the walls and uh, and not getting water carryover, which will obviously freeze up your steam duct, which you don't want. Uh, but as the design evolved, we had to get more sophisticated because we needed this uh, flash evaporator to burn up the extra water that when we didn't need the fuel cell water. And we did that with that 40 to 56 set point. And so we needed a small evaporator uh, that could handle that. So it was called the topper. So it tops off the radiator. But when the doors are closed and there's nothing else to get rid of your heat, now you need a loss of capacity. And so the second uh, chamber was the high load chamber. Together, they do the whole job. When the radiators are working, only topper. Uh, so you, you can come home with uh, this system functional and, uh, and make it home. It turns out we never did freeze up the steam duct, so that part was good. It turns out that we had some freezing in the chamber. Uh, and in fact, we had to develop uh, a process that uh, acknowledged that that could occur and, and how would we flush it. It's called flushing. And so we did develop a process, and it has never failed. The flushing process always works. And we have had on several occasions, I probably can't count them for you, but four or five times maybe over the shuttle flights, it, we've had uh, some freezing inside the, uh, the cavities. Okay, there's a non-propulsive overboard vent. That was the uh, one going out both sides uh, for the topper because it could be used for very long times during the mission and you might be pointing or whatever you might be doing. But when you're coming home, the high load is just a big out the side of the vehicle type uh, uh, duct. The ammonia boiler, uh, its heat sink is ammonia. As I mentioned before, it evaporates uh, all the way to the ground where the water won't. Uh, the redundant boilers here up here, there are no redundant boilers. These two chambers have redundant everything. They have redundant feed water systems, and redundant control systems, redundant spray nozzles, redundant everything. But the chamber is a chamber. You get what you get. Uh, there are redundant boilers. This is the way the, re the ammonia boiler gets it re its redundancy. It's utilized uh, or was designed to be utilized during entry uh, and on the runway until uh, cooling is available. It turns out that we don't do that anymore. It turns out, operationally, we learned that if we cold soak the radiators before we shut the doors and then bypass them and come home on the flash evaporator, that there's a lot of heat capacity still left in those radiators, a lot of fluid out there, and it's cold. Uh, and so we can actually go all the way to uh, uh, wheel stop uh, on the radiator. And so at 175,000 feet, we start flowing the radiator. And but 100,000 feet, the flash evaporator uh, is off, and we cold soak all the way home. And after wheel stop, the ammonia boiler cranks up. I mentioned the Freon 21, the low viscosity. Uh, we've got an excellent performance out of that. Uh, the low viscosity is really, really important. As much parallelism as we have, they didn't really give you the numbers. Uh, in the single panels, we have 26 tubes in the. Uh, uh, Two-sided panels, I believe there are 66 tubes. Lots of tubes, lots of parallelism. So uh, it's awfully easy to, uh, to get flow instability uh, uh, in a thermal system like that. But the Freon loop does great. We have redundant pumps, all liquid heat exchangers and cold plates. This is that uh, chamber that I told you. If you can look right down here, this is a people right here. Eh, one person. Uh, this, in fact, there's a radiator panel. Uh, this was during buildup. Uh, twice we tested the flash evaporator in this environment, once as part of the integrated system with all the radiators, and once by itself. And twice we tested the radiators. One is 
part of the integrated system and once by themselves. So we did uh, essentially uh, three tests, large tests, and the one that had the entire system in it, that had all the coal plates, that had, had everything in it, is, as I said, the most uh, sophisticated uh, thermal test we've ever done at JSC. And it proved that the system could work. It also proved that we had to tune the flash evaporator nozzle because it was wrong. But we did get the data, we did prove it was wrong, and we got it remachined. Machined out of Columbium, somebody else will have to answer why. And uh, so it was a problem for Aaron to go get us another one, but uh, but it fixed it and it, it was successful. Well, that chamber was built uh, actually for Apollo, right? Did yes. It'll take a stacked, uh, you can have a command module and a service module and a stack configuration inside that chamber. And do, uh, it had uh, a solar and uh, full yeah, vacuum. We actually put men in there. Actually yes. In there it's man, it was a man chamber then. It's not, not now. I, after Apollo Soyuz, it, it hasn't been manned <coughs> since then. But it's still available for testing, but it's not manned. It has a sister chamber uh, 100 feet that way where all of the EVA testing is done. It's a good example, I think, of how the shuttle program built on a lot of the power. Same thing at, at the Cape, where a lot of the launch hardware was adapted. Because the shuttle program, you know, you heard about the budgetary constraints. The shuttle program never could have afforded to build something like that. But luckily, a lot of this equipment was built during Apollo, and the money was much more available. Okay, if you've been keeping count, uh, we're getting toward the end here. I did want to mention before we left uh, uh, the main orbiter systems that uh, there was some rotating equipment life testing that we did for the program. The equipment we're talking about here is the cabin fan, the water gas separators, the avionics bay fans, cabin coolant, uh, and the vehicle coolant pumps. The life requirement was 100 missions, and that was uh, calculated by somebody to be 20,000 hours. So if you could show 20,000 hours of successful operation, you had the design life uh, of the hardware. We, uh, we set up a, a laboratory uh, to uh, run the equipment. It was uh, obviously a, a low maintenance lab. We collected data and, and uh, checked in the room occasionally to see that everything was all right. It turned out that all the equipment uh, passed the 20,000 hour uh, requirement. We did learn something though, that some of that stuff was so noisy. Oh, it was noisy. So there was some work done on, on some muffling, but, but the hardware itself uh, uh, was all good. Okay, we are at the end. Yes? Were there noise requirements for machinery? Yes, there was a cabin noise spec, uh, and, and yes, it had to be met. And I don't remember how it was met. Whether they'd we put, put mufflers, we put mufflers on some of the Maybe some insulation inside of the ducting. Uh, I'm not uh, sure. We have time. I'll tell a little anecdote here. Uh, we were out chair to the change control board. And the doctors, the medical organization, uh, came to see me and said that um, the cabin was very, very noisy and it was going to really uh, do a detriment to the astronauts. Um, and it was very expensive and very, uh, in terms of dollars and weight to uh, really get the uh, cabin, all the cabin fans and everything, cabin environment down to the uh, level they wanted. So I thought for a moment, I said, well, uh, I go out to California a lot, to, uh, I go out to Rockwell, and I, I stay in the motels that are on the Los Angeles freeway. And I said, uh, you don't seem to be worried about me, my ears, uh, in staying on those freeways and not being able to sleep and having all that noise. And the doctors looked at me for a moment and says, well, you're already deaf. <laughs> and I said, what did you say? So, uh, but we did have to make some modifications of it to actually uh, to uh, re reduce the noise. Let me uh, interject one item, I think. Somebody asked the issue about the IMU. We decided to pick the IMU off the shelves, and it was uh, air-cooled. To uh, really do it right, if we would have done it right, we would have picked an IMU which was uh, which was compatible with uh, with liquid cooling rather than you know, redesign it. But we decided to stick with the IMU that was uh, air-cooled. And whether that was the right decision to make, I don't know. It seemed like it was because we really, I think we've only had one problem with an IMU. I don't think we've had many problems with the IMU. But that's a, a little anecdote that I thought. That's a 
program manager's trait. Uh, probably the air cool uh, IMU was a less expensive option. It might have cost a little in terms of uh, thermal efficiency, but uh, that's only energy, power, and uh, power is available. So it was not a it was a good trade-off. Okay, this is the uh, the last of the uh, subsystem areas. This is the EVA uh, airlock support. Uh, the environmental thermal control and life support system does support the airlock. It maintains the uh, cabin pressure and composition during the uh, airlock repress and depress. This is really a requirement back on the on the ARS and the the. the uh, pressure and composition control system because airlock use basically dumps cabin gas and then you repress the airlock so it's a requirement that you cannot upset the cabin while you're doing the EVA function. We also provide the uh, service and cooling umbilical. Uh, if you have any kind of mental picture of being in the airlock, the crew is uh, connected with cooling and oxygen through an umbilical, uh, so they don't use the consumables in their spacesuit and backpack. Uh, and so that's provided by the ETCLSS. Uh, heat rejection, the uh, crew wears a liquid cooling garment, and the cooling for that is done by the vehicle until you go EVA, of course. Uh, then the recharge. We supply the backpack O2 recharge from the uh, the cryo, the 900 psi cryo. We supply the water to recharge for the sublimator. The uh, EMU uses a, another. The EMU is uh, NASA's overrun with acronyms. EMU is extravehicular mobility unit, which means nothing either. Spacesuit and backpack. So the spacesuit and backpack uses an evaporative heat sink, and it uses a sublimator. And the idea there is it's a device that that uh, exposes a layer of ice to space and then it sublimates and you get your cooling from that as opposed to putting uh, liquid water on a surface and, and flashing it. Uh, but anyway, that has to be serviced and so that water is provided from the, the system. And then the condensate that the crew brings back off an EVA, that's a sweaty job. Uh, that condensate goes back into the system. So the airlock support is another part of uh, this uh, system. In fact, that's the sixth part, so we are through. This is a picture of the airlock. Not really the airlock. This is the test chamber that we built to put the equipment in. You notice it has uh, uh, the right hatch in it, uh, and if you can recall back an hour and a half ago, it showed you a picture where there was the, this hatch basically on the other side of the, uh, of the back side of the, the test chamber. We hook those together because, as I said, as you depress and repress the airlock, it affects the cabin. So we needed a, a, a test environment that had both those simultaneously. But the difference is this has to go all the way to vacuum. So we connected this to our uh, vacuum system, and uh, when the crew is inside this, it's a, it's a manned vacuum test. And when the crew is inside the, uh, the other uh, uh, test chamber, it's basically sea level, or at most 8 PSI would be the lowest it would ever be. Uh, and I think the last picture is a, a spacesuit uh, inside the airlock. And this is just a little cutaway showing the, showing the airlock. Uh, this was mounted on the back of that chamber you saw earlier. So okay. Bring that picture back. I'll, I'll talk to that for just a minute because uh, and, and then we'll, uh, we'll have some questions. But um, before every flight, uh, one of the things that we do uh, is that every EVA crew member takes his or her spacesuit into that EVA test chamber, into the airlock test chamber. So you actually get a chance to, to take your own suit down to vacuum. Uh, and particularly before you do your, your very first uh, EVA, it, it's really a confidence builder because uh, the physical sensations that you get in a suit, remember you're, you're at about 4 PSI pure oxygen environment, and your, your body, the inside of your mouth feels a little different. There's funny sounds when the, with the fans inside the suit. Um, the sorts of things you don't want to experience the first time when you actually go outside into space. It's much better to do it here in a controlled environment where if there's a problem, uh, actually you're, you're supported because of the, the weight of the suit 
doesn't look like there's anybody in this suit no, now. No. So, but when you're in the suit, you're actually supported by a cable to the uh, to the ceiling of the chamber, which is on quick release bolts. So, uh, picture to the left there. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you're suspended up here, and if you ever have a problem, they can release this repressurize the uh, chamber within about 30 seconds I think that's the the, the limit for a, for a man rated chamber you got to be able to to repress in about 30 seconds and then just lift you out you know suit and all from the top and and get you out of your suit and and get you to the medics so um, this is just an inverted bell jar there's no the hatch is not sealed when you depress it just like pulls it down seals yeah. due to the pressure difference so you know yet another you just lift the top off. you know yet another example of the uh, the extensive testing that, that we go through before uh, before every mission so I, I might add one more thing I forgot actually to add earlier is that uh, the man rating is a is a term used in in manned spacecraft uh, which means that you've specifically tested it and s said that it's it's its design is worthy of, of supporting a human uh, the airlock had to provide that function uh, so Aaron was faced with man rating the airlock and uh, uh, man test capability is very scarce, very scarce. In fact, JSC may be the only place anymore that can do it. Uh, uh, but anyway, we uh, volunteered to do that as part of our test program as a programmatic requirement, not as testing or watching or confirming anything, but as a prime uh, part of the test program was the man rating of the airlock, and that was, that was done in Houston. More That's an interesting uh, thought. Uh a long time, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, one of the problems we had in the early part of the manned space program was doing some chamber runs with Donald Douglas with a two-gas system where we actually lost either the oxygen regulator or the nitrogen regulator in the chamber and almost lost the test subject. And that's when we went to, that's when uh, Apollo decided to go to 100% oxygen. And that's uh, what led up to the fire on the pad. We went to 100% oxygen at 16 pounds per square inch with an inward opening hatch for another reason. And that's really, uh, if you can realize that 100% oxygen at 16 psi, everything burns. Uh, stainless steel uh, is not self extinguishing at 16 psi. And of course, that's what we were up to 204, uh, when we had the 204 fire, or Apollo 1 fire on the pad. And it was a function of uh, losing, uh, doing some tests to work uh, with the combined atmosphere. So, uh, so you got to be careful sometimes you don't overreact. So then we went back to uh, uh, a different type of atmosphere. Lang, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, the systems you've been describing today seem to take up a lot of you know, space um, in the order of like, like other systems. How did you negotiate with um, with managed in other subsystems, you know, for the space and the jump, the volume and the, the weight that you wanted? That, that's a good question, but it's uh, uh, you're in the, you're asking the wrong person. We uh, we're the government. We hired a contractor to design the vehicle. Now the design aspects of it, the, the philosophy of it, the functionality of it, we were very, very integral with. But we really didn't, we watched, we audited, we said that looks smart, but we didn't go and say put that cold plate here and put that heat exchanger there. The vehicle integrated design was, was a rock roll. Let me tell you how it was done. Actually, in those years, we didn't have CAD CAM systems. And what we did is use everything on mock-ups. We did mock -ups. So the, the uh, system was laid out of what to do and the functions of what they had to do and the plumbing. And this was all laid out in a mock-up. And basically that was that's how it was negotiated in terms of what you need. In today's environment, in today's environment, you wouldn't do that. You would use electronic uh, capability. You use your CAD CAM systems. You would actually draw it up on your computer. Uh, in fact, the 777 was built that way. The 777 at Boeing was built. Uh, they didn't use even hard. They didn't use hard mock-ups. They used electronic.
chronic mock-ups. And that's what we would do today, and it would be much easier. You would probably call all the engineers together, you would sit down and show how the equipment was laid out, get a satisfactory buy-off on it, and do it much more rapidly, much more quickly. So in the future, what you'll be doing is be actually using a CAD CAM system or a CAD system to actually uh, negotiate the, the, the space you need for it. So uh, it, that's a good question, and it, it, it was based on uh, purely uh, <coughs> that you would get drawings, mock-ups, go out and lay it out in a, in a soft mock-up or a hard mock-up. You'd get the engineers to come out, the manufacturing people to come out. you say, this is how it's going to look, and get a buy-off on it. Uh, today, you wouldn't do it that way. You would do it all electronically, so uh, it would change. Uh, well, let me ask you a question. Uh, of all the work you've done uh, in the in the shuttle, what was your most uh, biggest concern in getting uh, ready to fly or during the flight? What, what did you have the biggest concern about? I was young and confident. I don't know that I had a specific uh, area that I was... Uh, I was yeah, really concerned right about here. it. People right here, right? You're young and confident. Uh, I did recognize, though, but but it did result in, in the integrated test that I showed. I did recognize that we had the most highly integrated thermal control system ever conceived. And it had, as I said, modes within modes. It changed modes with respect to the vehicle phases. It changes mode with respect to operation. Uh, we had 9 PSI that went to 10.2 PSI. We had 8 PSI. We had thermal control loops, ammonia boilers, flash evaporators. So I, I did recognize the sophistication. Uh, in fact, we uh, proposed early on to use that large chamber uh, in uh, an integrated vehicle test. Not we, not we, me, but the big we uh, looked at an integrated test like the command service module was tested. Uh, and that was viewed to be impractical. There was a cut it off at the bulkhead. You could do the forward cabin part and then do the aft section. Uh, but that was viewed to be impractical. But it still was a very uh, integrated design. All the systems engineering that that uh, was there uh, created that uh, interdependency. And uh, I think I was smart enough to know that there was certainly some uh, potential risks there. Uh, but we did. Uh, Remember in the very beginning of this, I talked about uh, ownership uh, of all the technical aspects. We had we had ownership. Uh, we believed that what we had done was prudent, appropriate, and we believed it would work. So it wasn't like you bought something and you hope it works. Can you say a word of what you think? Uh, uh, this is looking in your crystal ball about the CEV. Do you think it's going to have a very similar type system, or, or what, have you thought about that? Well, we hope so. Uh, our new administrator uh, has sort of a back to the grassroots uh, uh, philosophy, or at least right now. And so we hope that the CEV will be developed uh, uh, with a lot of uh, uh, government involvement, that the government will have ownership again of the technical aspects of the design. If that happens, uh, then I think uh, I think a lot of the experience that's around uh, and a lot of the the free thinking and the independence that the government can bring to that. There's another school of thought that says keep the government out of the way and let the contractor go do their thing. And uh, obviously you wouldn't get that position from me, but there are people that believe that's the right way to do it. So, uh, Do you think the system will look pretty much like this or, or similar to it? Or? Well, uh, I th similar, yes, I do think so. I, I, I believe that uh, the very tight schedule for the CEV is going to put a lot of pressure on the program manager to go with the tried and true. So I don't think there's going to be innovation that has risk with it. Maybe there'll be innovation that's good engineering, but I think the innovation with risk will be very much minimized, minimized because taking shuttle offline in 2010, it's going to be a lot of pressure to get uh, this vehicle finished. So I think that's going to breed some conservatism on the design side. We, um, we talk about um, considering, uh, you know, operation, um, 
while you're doing the design um, but there were always things once the design was made well like like you mentioned once we came up with a requirement for a 10.2 cabin we had to develop workarounds and one of the other things that that after the system is designed we then start to figure out how can it fail and work on malfunction procedures and I know that the the malfunction procedure for loss of two coolant loops that was probably the worst simulation case that we ever had to deal with I'm, I'm curious to get your opinion because just you know Walt described how we have two independent cooling loops so that in principle you, you one failure won't take them both out now I don't remember what it was but they did discover a single point failure somewhere in there which I think was corrected but where you could have lost both of the cooling loops with a single failure I, I don't know if you the, the only failure I remember is one that the John Young used to worry about it, it had to do with if you did lose a radiator uh, that that could uh, bleed your accumulator down and and uh, so they did add an isolation valve on, so they can isolate the radiator side but the idea was to obviously not lose your fluid with a single hit that even though you have a nice completely functional thermal control system it's useless because it has no fluid but we, we did have a, a, an emergency deorbit procedure for loss of two Freon cooling loops and it was of all the things that we practiced that was the hairiest because it was absolutely time critical you know at this point you have no way of getting heat out of the cabin so you can't ultimately cool your electronics uh, the cabin gets hot your electronics get hot so you have to do an immediate deorbit hopefully you're within range of a landing site um, and then on you turn off all the equipment that you can possibly turn off including most of your computers and and when you're riding down through entry you basically watch the temperature of, of the computer and as the as each computer would get up to its failure temperature you would then switch on the next computer transfer the data you know <laughs> turn off the, the, the computer which is just about failed and, and and hopefully you could make it to the ground and and I know the instructors who who would uh, you know lead us through this exercise said that the the information they had gotten from the thermal analysts was that nobody was really sure whether we could make it I don't know what your opinion was on that. <laughs> we, we practiced it but you know obviously as I've, I think I've told you nobody's ever died in a simulator but you, n you never know whether the thermal model that they use in the simulator is really going to duplicate the way the shuttle is going to behave in a absolute emergency situation like that so we survived in the simulator but I don't know what you're, you're well, we, we do address the thermal uh, thermal model accuracy uh, we do specific testing to uh, validate the thermal model so we do have pretty good confidence in those but the real issue in, in overheat is it when does a piece of equipment stop working in an overheat situation I mean there's no magic number it's not like 143 degrees it's okay and 144 it's not okay so and it varies it varies with age it varies with equipment it varies with a lot of things so uh, there wasn't really a precise answer as to how long you could keep everything functional and, and come home yes um, you talked earlier a little bit about oxygen nitrogen mixing in the cabin I was wondering if there was a way to really study that on the ground since you're not in the you know, zero G environment you know, how you know they're not pockets of nitrogen sitting around that astronaut can stick his head into very good I, I just forgot to mention that earlier yeah. the testing that we ran we had to set it up very carefully uh, so let's see maybe I can probably won't work but oh yes it will Let's see. Yeah, well, it's all right. It didn't really, if we could get, yeah, I was looking at the ETA slide. The two decks. Go down a little further. This one. Uh, yeah, well, that's the outside. The next slide. Right. If you notice, there's a flight deck and a mid deck. So obviously, buoyancy. It's going to mix that stuff for you. So what we did is we set up a, a thermal condition where less than one degree thermal gradient everywhere in there had to exist before we ran the test. And that was to guarantee that we had no help from, from uh, circulation, naturally induced circulation. But you're absolutely right. That test would have been a useless test without n n uh, neutralizing the gravity effects. 
and we actually uh, the first time that I did the spacesuit test in there, we actually used the 10.2 protocol. So I actually had to go in the day before, take the cabin, take that to 10.2, spend the night, and then we can do just a 40-minute pre-breathe. For most of the other tests, when you go in, um, you, in order to avoid the inconvenience and expense of staying through the night, you go in early in the morning, and then you're coming right from a from a sea level environment. So before you go down to four psi in the suit, you actually have to pre-breathe pure oxygen for four hours. As as Walt said, that was the alternative. So you basically just get in your suit, and you know they you can either bring a book and read your book, or they'll they'll pipe music into you if you want to give them a CD, or I guess it was a audio cassette in those days, or or they have a little black and white TV monitor that they can share. So, and you just sort of sit there for four hours, and then once you've uh, finished the pre and the problem is you're not allowed to go to sleep, because that would be the easiest thing, but they want you actually to move around, because when you're moving your muscles, you're you're actually then doing a better job of denitrogenating, so you have to stay awake, and if, if you don't say anything for more than about 10 minutes, they'll, you know, they'll pipe something in and say, Jeff, are you awake, you know, so, but it, I mean, this was a, a, a very, very useful facility. I mean, they, they used it for all different sorts of things, and and it's, uh, I guess that was the the one of the one new facility which was built for the shuttle. Yes, specifically. Jeff oh, Jeff oh, mentioned yeah. several times the 10.2, and I talked about the nine. The nine was the original design, but the issues with the nine psi uh, had to do with. Uh, uh, you have to take the oxygen percentage got too high, right? Right, and so there was much concern about flammability. So the idea was if you could raise the pressure up some to 10.2, uh, then that would be uh, less flammability issue. But then the problem became at uh, 10.2 uh, that the suit at 4 psi was uh, t too much of a drop. If you if you're in the bins world diving, somebody mentioned diving earlier, uh, scuba. Uh, you can usually use a two to one. So if you don't reduce pressure more than half, you're probably okay. You're probably not going to get the bins. But half a ten point two is not four, and the suit's at four. So there was that issue again. So they raised the bump the suit up a little bit, and uh, they got it up to four point three, and uh, went to ten point two and developed the pre breathe protocols that made that acceptable. So that's sort of had balanced out. But that was another operational move later. Yeah, and as Walt said, you, you're spending enough time once you get in the suit and you purge all the nitrogen out and so you're you're sitting in a pure oxygen environment. You've got to do a bunch of tests and check out, you know, communication tests and cooling tests so that you, you basically, you're not losing much time by having to spend 40 minutes pre-breathing. So it, it the whole thing worked out pretty well. Yeah. And, and it'll be an interesting question how they designed the CEV because the CEV has to be compatible with docking to the space station, which works at a sea level environment. But on the other hand, if you're going to take the CEV into a situation where you want to do a lot of spacewalks, you probably want to be able to operate it at probably more like uh, eight and a half or nine psi, so that you can go right into a spacesuit without uh, without an extensive pre-breathe. And of course, people are always trying to figure out: could we design the space suit to work at a higher pressure, but then you you give up maneuverability. We'll, we'll talk about that in, in another lecture that I'll that I'll be giving on EVA systems. So Walt, thank you very much. Oh, enjoy it.